Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all to Kroll's Network of Women event. Um, not only is this our first now virtual event, it's also the first time since Duff and Phelps has rebranded as Kroll. Um, so we're excited to, to see you all this morning. Um, maybe firstly, just before we start, just a couple of housekeeping items just to make you um, aware of. Um, firstly, this morning's event is being recorded. So um, there will be a, web, a webinar replay available and email around in the next few days. Secondly, and much more importantly, we would love to get your feedback and get you involved in the discussion. So you will all see a little questions box there um, down the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to pop in any questions that you might have for our um, panel and I will try to get them uh, to as many of them as I, as I can. I'm also very mindful that we have some audience members dialed in this morning who are attending a NOW event for the first time, so you're all very welcome. Um, many of our regular guests will know that Kroll's Network of Women was originally um, set up back in 2012 by our New York office um, to att help attract, retain and um, develop women within the firm as we work our way along our career paths. And a big part of that development is managing and building our network which is why we love these events so much. Unfortunately, we don't get to do this morning's um, in person, but when we do get to meet in person, it's always a great opportunity to catch up with fellow professionals, with our clients, with our colleagues and our friends, and to help support each other in our careers. <clears throat> Um, we had our last in-person event just before the pandemic hit in February 2020 and we had the wonderful Georgie Crawford um, take us through her really inspiring um, journey. So I suppose a lot has happened since then over the last 15 months. We've all been challenged um, in both our professional and our personal lives while we're trying to figure our way through um, this surreal pandemic. But I think it's st finally starting to feel like there is light at the end end of the tunnel um, and we thought this morning as we start to think about life post-COVID and we're hoping to all get back to some socialising, maybe getting back into an office environment and meeting up and starting to see each other again, we thought it would be a nice time to take an hour away from the busy work environment and talk about fashion, something that's very close to all of our um, hearts and maybe think about it from a few different um, perspectives. So I am delighted to be introducing our esteemed panel this morning. I'm sure uh, most of you are very familiar with uh, the very talented ladies that we have here today, but I think it's really important to give a, a big shout out and celebrate how well they've all done in their careers to date. Um, so maybe firstly uh, introduce Sonia Lennon, um, who is a prominent fashion stylist, broadcaster, designer, businesswoman and, and social entrepreneur. She's a big supporter of uh, Irish design Design and has twice been elected onto the Board of um, Design and Crafts Council of Ireland. And back in 2015, Sonia also launched the inaugural chapter of uh, for Ireland in Dress for, of Dress for Success. And I'm really looking forward to chatting to Sonia a little bit about that uh, more later on, if that's okay. Um, we also have Deirdre McQuillan with us this morning, who is an accomplished journalist who writes about fashion, design and textiles um, and is fashion editor of the Irish Times um, with a weekly column in the on fashion in the Irish Times Sunday magazine and she's also reported from London and Paris um, fashion weeks for more than a decade and again is particularly focused on Irish fashion um, and a big supporter of Irish brands so looking forward to getting a big insight in, into that from from Deirdre. And finally, we have Courtney Smith, who has uh, creative directed and styled shoots and video content uh, globally for a number of high profile brands that include Primark, H&M, Louis Vuitton. And she's very much in demand as a creative director for magazine editorials, including the likes of um, Irish Tatler Image um, and uh, has also been featured on Vogue.com. She's also very passionate about um, supporting Irish brands, but also very importantly, Courtney has very recently become a mum uh, to a gorgeous baby boy so big congratulations on that and we very much appreciate you taking time away from your little man this morning to to have a chat with us so thanks very much for that Courtney. Um, <laughs> so maybe just before we get into the group discussion we'd love to hear some feedback from our audience and your views this morning so I'm going to just start off with a really quick um, poll to gauge how everybody is feeling um, I am keeping my fingers crossed that this works uh, okay let's see 
uh, launch. Okay, so what is currently the biggest factor um, influencing your mindset um, or self-confidence at the moment? Is it one, working from home, uh, lack of social opportunities, video calls or Zoom meetings, being out of routine or general COVID um, fatigue? Um, Sonia, while we're waiting for the results, I might ask you, are any of these resonating with you at the moment? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at them now and I suppose, you know, I, I can see where, where the winners are and, you know, general COVID, COVID yeah. fatigue is, is um, I actually feel we're slightly um, institutionalized by it, that it's, it's, it's almost, you know, we would have thought we'd have flown back out of the coop, got straight back into things. Um, but we're, it's, it's almost like kind of a Pavlov dog syndrome. We've been kicked so many times, we're afraid to come out of the cage. So I think it's getting that confidence back into society and into the economy to know that it's going to be okay, <laughs> you know, yeah. and I think we have a responsibility to share that message. Yeah, definitely. And look, that, that's exactly what people are seem to be feeling this morning. So whilst a lot of us are getting a bit fed up with not being able to go out and working from home, it's definitely and I'm I'm absolutely in that camp of general COVID fatigue is is uh, is is 44 percent. So, um, yeah, look, that's interesting though to see that there's a mix of views uh, across the board there. Um, as well and look maybe as given the results and as we start to think about you know um life post covid and, and post covid um fashion um a lot of us maybe who have previously spent our professional lives you know running around in heels wearing business suits have been able to swap them out for the last 15 months for runners and and and, and more casual wear but i suppose given where we're going at the moment over the next while we're going to start to see that's just likely going to be for a lot of businesses a blended and um, view on working going forward with you know maybe spending half your time in the office and, and, and half your time at home so Courtney I'm curious how do we tear ourselves out of our comfy stretchy pants and our loungewear and our runners and you know after the last 15 months and do you think that you know business wear you know suits and heels are are gone for good or, or is that all coming back you know over the next few months I think there's almost two answers to this. I think there's going to be two different rules of thought because in, on one hand, obviously, we have spent the last 15 months in a much more casual uh, format. We've been living in our loungewear and our joggers. You know, we've all seen the Zoom jokes like business on top, loungewear at the bottom or underwear at the bottom sometimes. Um, but I actually think that COVID just sped up the inevitable because I feel like a lot of the like the fashion industry were going down that very casual route anyway and we saw the likes of Yeezy and Balenciaga doing the the super looks casual but like in a really expensive way and you already kind of saw touches of that coming into people's everyday wear even in the business uh, in business attire so I feel like you know, it probably would have happened anyway, but COVID just kind of, yeah, sped up the inevitable. However, on the flip side of that, there's there's also, I suppose, this hunger again to get dressed up. I know I have it. I've been living in loungewear and any excuse I have to go on a Zoom or like this, I'm like, oh, I can put my outfit on because it's exciting. Fashion is fun. Fashion, you know, you can express yourself. And I feel like there, there's going to be two schools of thought there. So in answer to your question, I actually, I don't think there is a straight, straightforward answer because I feel like it really will come down to personal preference and your personal style. And I, but I do hope that in, in one way that we can take a little bit of both sides from it, because I feel like it would be really nice to allow people who are in a very formal business setting to add a little bit of personality back into their, their business outfit. So it might be that you still wear the suit, but you might go for something a little bit more relaxed or a little bit more casual underneath, rather than wearing a shirt or a blouse, you might add something a bit more informal or relaxed. Um, or you might wear a more relaxed outfit, but you'll put it with heels. So yeah. I feel like it's gonna open up for for us that we can express our style uh, and our personal style in a much bigger and better way. 
Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I mean, the only thing is like, like for sometimes, you know, in a work and like today is probably an example like that, you know, like I, I'm in my, you know, normally in my, my, my comfy bottoms and my runners or whatever. But then this morning I'm like, do you know what? Nobody can see, but I'm going to pop on a pair of heels because you feel like that, you know, sometimes that's part of your dressing yourself. You're in the, the business mode then as well. And now my heels don't match what the rest of what I'm wearing, but that doesn't matter because nobody can see. But, you know, like sometimes that is part of, you know, part of the, you know, getting yourself ready. And but yeah, I, I agree with you. I think, you know, it's been really interesting how at the start of COVID, people were still wearing a suit on Zoom, you know, especially the lads, you know, yeah. whereas now they're all in, everyone's in T-shirts. You know, it's funny how over the months, everybody's gotten a lot more comfortable being casual. So, you know, yeah. I am intrigued to see what's going to happen when we, we, we get back into the offices. But you're right, it's allowing people to express their style and their personality probably a little bit more than they they would have before absolutely I, I think there's a I think there is a place for the business suit <clears throat> I love a great tailored suit I love seeing men and women in beautiful tailored looks um I just feel like it can open up the conversation or open up the opportunities for people to express their personal style more yeah. I still I wouldn't want to to go to meet my solicitor or my accountant and to see him there in a baggy track suit you know what I mean? I, I just, I wouldn't want to. I'd want to see a level of professionalism in yeah. how they dress, but I still feel like that it doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to be either extreme. It, there should yeah. be a happy medium in the middle. And I think, I think we are about to see a lot more of that uh, explored. Yeah, brilliant. Great. Thanks. And and Sonia, can I ask you maybe um, when you're um, designing the Lennon Courtney brand, you know, are you having to take into consideration the the kind of the changes in the trends and how we're maybe being more mindful of, of, of comfort and casualness going forward? How is it impacting you from a yeah. business perspective? A hundred percent. I mean, we we are we would consider ourselves as a very commercial, responsive brand. So even in terms of how we um, communicate with our customers, myself and Brendan are on our social media channels, and um, you know, fielding questions and answers to questions all the time from from the women who wear our clothes. Um, and and so the one thing that we're really mindful of, we started out as a sort of a sports looks brand, very very. Um, you know, uh, streamlined, uh, very contemporary fabrics. And we've really gone back there now, um, uh, really at, at our core, but it has to be about comfort. And I think that's um, <clears throat> the one thing that we have to get our heads around is you can you can wear any style you want, but comfort is kind of non-negotiable at this stage. We've all learned what it feels like to wear elasticated waistbands. We don't want to be crippled in stupid shoes that we can't walk in. Th those days are over. And actually, social movements like Me Too and even Black Lives Matter have, have really um, changed the social discourse around who we are and our identities and how we present ourselves. And, and so that, that comfort piece is really paramount. And so for us, when we design, we're designing, you know, form and fit and feel all at the same time um, because we're not going back there. And even if you think about 100 years ago, the last 20s, the roaring 20s, all those styles, even though they were very opulent, were not form fitting. They were very loose very freeing so i mean i think there's a lot of parallels between what happened as a response to the great depression and the great sort of uh, boom that happened after that and where we are now i think we can learn a lot by looking backwards yeah no that's great yeah i'm i'm all about the flowy and baggy at the moment uh with, with post-covid so yeah i like the sound of that <laughs> um maybe just moving on to um sustainability you know given that we're we're starting to think about what's in our wardrobe versus you know what we have versus what we might need and you know we're thinking about getting back out there and socializing and or returning into the office environment you know one of the big topics we're hearing a lot about is sustainable fashion and and that can mean different things to to so many different people and um, sometimes it feels like sustainable fashion is either buying in a charity shop or spending a fortune on you know an ethical brand or, or, or a boutique and um, Deirdre maybe if I could ask you on this one you know what sustainable Irish sustainable brands are you seeing out there and, and, and are these businesses doing well abroad? Well sustainability is the biggest issue at the moment in fashion and it's almost like becoming a selling point I'm I'm getting emails nearly every day from brands saying they're sustainable but there's actually no way of accreditation I mean it's not like in food where if you say something is free range or organic it's 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 it's, it's regulated so you can make any kind of claim for your brand 
but there's no way of ensuring that it is actually verifiable. There's a lot of greenwashing when it comes to sustainability. I like to think of that the pandemic has made us think a bit more about what we're buying and how we're buying. Um, and it's, it's, it's the priorities in our life generally. Um, and maybe we should talk more about conscious fashion you know, thinking about if you're going to buy something, am I going to wear this once or am I going to wear it 30 times? Um, so there are a number of, of very interesting Irish brands. In fact, the latest one claims to be completely sustainable. And it's the first time I've ever got an email from somebody who says that, you know, every step of the way is certifiable and it's called a for after. Okay. And it the dresses are lovely, actually, and not very expensive. So that's one that I would recommend. And there are others. Native Denim, for instance, makes jeans, customizes jeans. But they say that they put back into jeans what the high street takes out. And they give you a five-year guarantee. And they expect you to wear them for at least 20 years. So that's very sustainable. And then there's another one called the Land Scheme. And they are really wonderful tweed uh, blazers. Uh, Rain, rainwear in in tweed and linen, all made all made from Irish fabrics, um, and that's selling internationally. There's grown clothing; uh, they make t-shirts and tops. And every time you buy a t-shirt, they plant a tree, which I like the idea of. Then there's uh, Alice Halliday down in West Cork. She gets she got a lot of coverage from the New York Times actually because she makes all sorts of collections just from dead stock fabric from old, old fabrics. Some people keep sending her old fabrics, so she's got a constant supply from admirers and so on. And she makes wonderful headwear as well. And then there's um, Katie Ann McGuigan. She's Irish, but she's based in London, and everything is made locally. And she's also redoing um, Irish knitwear in a really wonderful way. She's one of the first to use Irish, native Irish wool. And that's another thing I feel very strongly about. We talk about cotton, which there's 10,000 litres of cotton going into one pair of jeans. Think about that as waste. And we have all these sheep in Ireland, lots of wool, we should be, and great knitters. So those are some areas I think that we could support. Great. And um, in terms of, you know, you're saying that, you know, it's, it's, it's not regulated. So, you know, how do you know then when you're buying, you're just, you're, tr you're, you're trusting that you're picking those brands that you know are well, you know, are well established in it, with a sustainable reputation or, you know, you're, 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 you're just, you know, like I can see a lot of the big brands now within, within their lines will have a sustainable, you know, uh, line within that. So, so you're just, there's no way of... Yeah, I think it's very interesting. H&M do a conscious collection. Yeah. Primark are doing organic cotton. So the big brands are have, are listening to us. And that's what's interesting. I mean, when you think that Zara produced in 2018, 450 million items of clothing, and that we throw away 2.1 billion tons every year. Think about wow. the waste. So the big brands are listening to us, the consumer, and certainly the young generation are very, very aware of waste and landfill and all the, you know, the, the damage that's done to our environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's an interesting um, sort of sidebar to that, actually, Deirdre, and it comes on the back of a conversation that we were having with Len and Courtney the other day around, you know, recycled fabrics. And the certification piece is actually quite onerous and expensive for manufacturers to go through. So we have some very small boutique uh, suppliers and manufacturers who we work with who can't afford to go through that process of certification. So we can get certification for recycled fabrics that we use from the bigger suppliers, but not from the little guys. So it's incredibly complex. So And we want to support the little guys, but the little guys can't afford to go through that process. So we can't call out the recycled fabrics from the smaller suppliers. So it, 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 the nuances in the processes are enormous. I think that's probably why the regulation just isn't happening. There are efforts, I know that, um, to certify, and there are certain elements that are, but I, I take your point. I just think it's very, very unfair, particularly for small small producers trying to do their best. You know, the big boys have the money and the clout and the so on, but the, the point about it is that once they start to do it, it raises awareness, you know, and eventually okay. things change. That's the point. And we've yeah. seen that conversations are changing 
in the supply chain. They're front and center now, all those conversations. Their ability to actually achieve and, and to come through on them is rising slowly depending on their might. I mean, yesterday, where was I? I was in, I, was it in, in Marks and Spencers and everything was, it was, no, it was in Primark, re recycled polyester. And there's a whole heap of stuff in there that's all recycled polyester. So, I mean, they're, they're, they're getting the message. It's not 100% of what they do, but I think it's, it is a raising, it's, it's raising awareness amongst people who, we, we do have to think about these things a bit more, you know. Um, I think we have a responsibility, and there's nothing wrong with buying from the high street. But I, I like, but I, I would like to see us be able to support smaller brands like you in Ireland. And I think it's important that we buy Irish. The uh, young Irish designers and small Irish brands have had a very tough time during this pandemic. And you know, you're fighting the big guys all the time. So I think. As in the way that we started to shop local for food, maybe we should start to shop local for, for clothing. Yeah, yeah. very valid point. I think, yeah. I think it's such a, sorry, I think it's such a big, like it's a conversation that like, it's it's so vast, like there's no there's no end to it because like on on the flip side of that, like you also have to look at how many people Primark employ in Ireland how many jobs it gives, because sustainability isn't just one thing. It, 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 the conversation is so much bigger than just one thing. And like like uh, both Deirdre and Sonia were saying, I think we should be encouraging and supporting all the brands for making all these small changes because they're changes in the right direction. They're not all there yet, but at least they're listening and they're, they're making those small differences. I think yeah. it's interesting. I, I was terribly taken by the fact that Carrie Simons actually rented her wedding dress for the day for 40. I mean, that sends a signal, doesn't it? Because it's a huge expense, um, a wedding dress. You wear it once. And I mean, it, it, in its way, what it was saying, look, I can look absolutely beautiful and wonderful and wear a dress that was, otherwise I could never afford. And it's only for the day. So I think all these other things that are happening in recycling and reselling and vintage buying, that's a huge trend at the moment. I mean, you're even finding big stores bringing in so whole sections on vintage wear and whatever, Depot you know, Vestiaire and uh, My Wardrobe HQ. I mean, there are all these places in which people can actually, instead of thinking that they're going to throw away something, that they can be reused, resold. And, and I think particularly, I have a friend who works for a very big company in Paris, very, very high in the administration, and he came home on holiday here. He couldn't get over the fact that his teenage nephew was making a fortune on Depop, buying and selling all these clothes to other kids. It's great, isn't it? I mean, this is this is the way this is happening, you know. Yeah. And I think you touched on that earlier around, you know, the younger generation definitely seem to be, you know, this is, you know, high on the agenda for them. You know, Sonia, are you seeing a different approach across different generations? Are we all getting on the boat or is it just the younger guys? Well, I, I, I think it's not, um, I, 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 I'm I old enough to know that nothing is black and white anymore and that there's a large grey scale in between. So I have um, boy-girl twins who are 16. Um, so I, I grew my own anthropological experiment to be able to explore this subject. Um, and, and so certainly um, the way that they're shopping and consuming and, and circularizing their decisions is very, very different. So, you know, it's not I buy something, I wear it a couple of times and I get rid. It goes around the cycle. It goes around the network of friends. It goes around deep. It keeps moving, keeps moving, keeps moving. And I think for me, when I think about what um, what the mission was with Dress for Success, it was really about niche recycling and um, professional wear from women who no longer needed it, who wanted to help another woman to succeed. And so for anyone who doesn't know dress for success is an organization that helps women to present and succeed at interview and um, so we we give her clothing for free that has all been donated and um, you know we give her the skills to succeed at interview using um professional mentors um and, and hr specialists and, and then if she gets the job she comes back and she gets three outfits to present herself with dignity until she's standing on her own two feet and all of that is for free for her so for me that's a a fantastic way and we're looking at weaving that more fully into Len and Courtney as well in terms of you know a br potentially a bring back scheme or how do you how do you you know join the dots with all of this stuff because everything that myself and Brendan do 
even outside of the brand, it's all linked back into the, the mission, which is to, you know, empower women, make them feel more confident um, and, and move towards equality, particularly in the workplace, because everything falls out of, uh, out of that at the end of the day. So I think we, we, we have choices and, and that's the human condition. Nobody tells us what we have to do. We have choices. And if we have money, we have more choices. So, so how are we going to um, design our own consumer journey from the point of purchase where you make considered purchases about um, how you spend your money right through to how you circularize that decision at the end? Yeah, yeah, no, great, and yeah, look, and it is interesting in terms of it's it's great the way you know as you're saying with your with your twins, you know the you know the the younger generation, you know they don't you know whereas you know maybe my age group or whatever are more like oh god I'm shopping in a charity shop, you know to kind of get yourself into that mindset where you know whereas it's easier to kind of go oh that's a you know I can see that a shop that I'm used to shopping in is now being more conscious and ethical and you know it's easier to sometimes go that way rather than be brave and going you know the charity shop route or you know something different and and even you know picking up Deirdre on what you said about you know um Carrie Simmons renting her wedding dress and all the outfits that she wore at the G G7 summit and she got huge publicity out of that you know and you would wonder is that something you know usually when you think about renting clothes you're thinking about you know when you're getting married your husband your everyone's buying their their outfits for the the, the, the bridesmaids <laughs> and, and the the bride but the, all the guys are, are renting their clothes as opposed to the women doing it so I do think it's really interesting um um concept and um actually Courtney, just on that I, I know of one I know of one bride one very savvy fashion bride who um wanted to wear a really expensive um wedding designer dress um and it, I think that the price tag was something like six and a half grand and before she went to buy it she uh rang a, a, a reseller in the UK gave her the model number of the dress and um, the retail price, the re the reseller gave her a buy price, which was about three and a half, four grand. Um, and said, if you if you bring it to me after one wear in perfect condition, I'll give you that resale price on it. And um, so she went and bought the dress, sold it, end up paying two and a half grand for a dress that would have cost six and a half grand. Wow. Um, that's smart <laughs> consumer. Yes. You know, yeah. that, that's the yeah. way to do that's it. Savvy. Yeah, you should start Bro, driving the dress service, you the next twenty years. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, I, and I think that look that that the more you hear about something like that, the easier it is then to you know your first thought is how do I do that? Where, you know, you know, where does, where do I start? So I think the conversation being out there and seeing other people doing it and reading about it online or in your magazine, you know, I think that make, makes people more comfortable with the concept of, of doing it. So, yeah, I mean, that sounds like a really smart lady uh, to me. Just before you Hello. move on, touch on that. Sorry, Courtney. <laughs> Sorry, Courtney. Sorry. Go ahead. But just, just touching on what Sonia said, there are really good uh, lending websites and stores in Ireland that do not specifically for bridal but for events and it's I think especially now like I know sitting down during COVID looking at all the pretty dresses that I own that I didn't get to wear for anything now I buy things with a purpose I never intend to just wear something once anyway but I didn't get to wear any of my gorgeous dresses to any events because all the weddings were cancelled all the races everything so mm -hmm. I think we're definitely going to see a big move towards borrowing um, clothes, especially kind of occasion wear. So I would definitely say check out Covet, which is in Paris Court, uh, shopping centre in Dublin. You've got Borrower's Boutique, which is a really good one as well. A lot of like really high end occasion wear. Um, and there's another one that is just, oh, onloan.co, which is, I think it's London based, but it's set up by two Irish girls. So they're definitely mm -hmm. ones worth checking out. You can, um, and the on loan one is all, um, again, high end designer, but not necessarily occasion wear. It's kind of more like everyday wear, um, but high end pieces. So definitely worth checking out if people are interested. Oh, great. Yeah, no, that's really good to know. Yeah, because like that, you, the, the first question is, how do I do this? Where do I go? So look, I think that's that's, that's really helpful. Um, and Courtney, I follow you on Instagram. And one of the things I often see that you're doing is you're, you're repurposing your own clothes. And I know that if I tried to turn one of my 
dresses into a skirt I would look like I just cut a big hole at the top of my dress and threw it over my head and maybe threw a <laughs> scarf around my waist I would not you know it just wouldn't work so I'm curious to know how do you go about that are you, you do you do some of that yourself or does that go to a tailor you get an idea on what you want and you go talk to somebody how do you approach that yeah, well, not anymore with baby. Yeah. <laughs> no <laughs> time is something you need. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, no, but I, uh, I go to it. I, I always tell people that you need to have a good seamstress. Um, and that's not just for repurposing or reimagining the clothes that are already in your web, in, in your wardrobe. It's also because women are made in different shapes and sizes. And whether you are buying something that's an atelier piece or you're buying off the peg so you're going into brown thomas even if it's a high-end piece you still probably will have to tweak something like it's very rare and um, it depends on, on what the pieces are made i know like len and courtney for example you make things specifically to be worn for different shapes and you show that in your campaigns but that, not everybody does that so if you're going in to buy something let's say from the couples or or wh whoever it may be chances are you might need to get it taken up a little bit if you're on the shorter side you might need to get it left down you might need to get the shoulders changed ever so slightly you might need to get the the sleeve length changed just to flatter you you know your body and i would always say that's definitely worth considering especially when you're buying on the high street because there, there's a reason they're more affordable because they're made in bulk so they're only made to suit one mannequin figure um and they're they're kind of carbon copied to that shape they're not made for all the lumps and bumps that women have um for the most part like i said that's not that's not every brand but um if, if you want to just think you know in, in a bigger scope um so i would say definitely you need a good seamstress or get handy with a with a, a sewing machine yourself um but yeah i love to shop in my own wardrobe and i love to wear a piece and then try and reimagine it for the next occasion slightly different so that might be making a dress into a skirt and top and then giving it more wearability because i can wear the top with jeans or i can wear the skirt with a jumper and um, i i've done that with a lot of the dresses that i have and it's a simple simple change not for me but for a seamstress it's a, it's a simple change um or even trouser length like if i've got a pair of palazzo pants that go all the way to the floor you know i might wear them for a couple of seasons like that and then i'm like okay these need a refresh so i'll make them into capri pants or i'll make them short you know what i mean just play around with them i've made trousers into shorts uh i've taken t t sleeves off shirts um, and you just get a complete refresh in your wardrobe and the plus side of that is nobody else has that item so your style stands out your personal style really stands out because you know that you're going to walk into an event or a room and there's not a hope anybody else is wearing the same outfit which which i really love um, and it's one of the reasons actually during lockdown i started i started this live on my instagram called uh, closet confidential and i interviewed different people from my wardrobe to their wardrobe um and i was making them go through their wardrobe and pick out their favorite pieces and like most of the feedback was I forgot I had this and you know made people really think about what was already in their wardrobe me included because I was doing it and I was finding pieces in my wardrobe that I forgot I had and learning to fall back in love with the pieces that you already purchased because you purchased them for a reason so I think we're we're so held up in that this like consumerism of just buy 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 new 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 like we, we forget the things that we already purchased um I, I do think we're slowly coming around to change and i think you know given what sonia and deirdre were talking about earlier like the consumers are already the ones making the the conscious changes and that's what's forcing the retailers and the designers to make change but um yes yeah, it's a slow process but i do think yeah uh, th that's what i do anyway shop my own wardrobe first and then also it makes you think about what you need. So yeah. I have all these amazing pieces in my wardrobe. Why am I wearing them? Okay, I'm not wearing them because I'm missing a key piece that pulls that outfit together. And then you can go and source that one piece that you're missing or those couple of pieces that you're missing rather than going into a store and just buying loads of stuff that never goes anything else that you own, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's uh, I love that I that concept of of shopping in your wardrobe. I definitely need well, to, I do try to do it more of that. I try yeah, to do it all again, and I, to my dismay, nothing would fit anymore. Oh, all the things too. So you're, you're not on your own there. <laughs> COVID weight. So I was looking, trying to shop my wardrobe, and thinking, oh gosh, I'll have to sort of 
tell me about my weight <laughs> beforehand. Actually, to go out and support <laughs> Irish brands, Deirdre. <laughs> That's how I look at it. Sizing is, a, is such a big issue at the moment um, because um, what is a 6 or a 10 or a 12 in one place isn't a 6 and a 12 in another. And the average size is 16. And an awful lot of the big brands stop at size 16. So I, th I think that's another issue that the, yeah. the fashion industry really needs to tackle is the sizing. And I'm sure, Sonia, you have uh, views on that because you would have learned a lot from starting your own brand. And this, I mean, I don't know what is the average size for, that you go up to and are you finding that people want bigger sizes and so on yeah, yeah we absolutely are and we're increasing our size range upwards and actually i'm lobbying to increase it downwards as well because um it, you know it's it's it, it's equally a problem if you're smaller than the average bear you can't find stuff to wear you know if you're bigger it's the same thing and i i don't think it's a different problem because we want to be able to um provide our clothes and and i suppose um, we have seen an increased demand. Uh, we are we are going up a size from next season, but but it's it's like anything, you know. There's no finish line. You have to keep tweaking it, keep making sure that the proposition is right. Um, and I think what's nice that we've seen in response to kind of our more relaxed styles is that they are giving larger women the confidence to to dive in and to enjoy that. Um, so it's 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 kind of almost like a sort of a magic moment in time where, where, you know, I have a friend who always wore leopard print and once about every eight or nine years, the trend would come to meet her and she used to go crazy. You know, she'd say, I, I, they've stolen it from me again. And then it would move on and she'd be left wearing her leopard print. But it's like that magic moment in time now where styling and fashion is really inclusive when you think about it in terms of that much more flowing look, you can wear it if you're very, very slim, you can wear it if you're bigger, um, and it looks great on all sizes. And in fact, we did a piece for our last campaign where we did one dress, six women, and, and, and handpicked customers from size eight to 18 to wear the same dress. And actually, it was kind of, the, the failing of, of the campaign is that it looked equally good and brilliant on all of them and you weren't able to kind of tell which size was which you know so brilliant. yeah i mean i think that's i think what uh, i was referencing earlier i loved that campaign yeah that's exactly yeah, the campaign i was referencing yeah you couldn't really tell who was which size in a way and you kind of want to be able to say oh well, it goes from there to there but you couldn't so yeah i think it's i think it's a great time to open up that conversation more and to, to drive it forward for sure right. Um, I I've actually have a, we have a good few questions coming in here um, and one interesting one here that actually goes on to our next topic. So I actually might move to the next topic and then um, throw yeah. this question out if that's all right. Um, might just move on to the future of uh, shopping. And I just, again, just a quick poll maybe from the audience, just kind of just to get, you know, like to get people's views um, on this one, if that's all right. So will you continue to shop online more than you did pre-lockdown despite the shops opening? So um, Yes, I now prefer to shop online. No, I can't wait to get back to the shops. About the same, or I don't know, or undecided. And um, so this is actually quite interesting. Um, so not many people are preferring to uh, shop online. Uh, we're at 43% can't wait to get back to the shops, and 28% uh, are about the same. So let's see if I can share those results. So yeah, we're all looking forward to. Uh, Get back sh back shopping. Um, that's that's interesting. Um, Deirdre, do you think with sh so many shops disappearing off the high street that the sh it sounds like the future isn't going to be online based on what people are are, are saying here? Do you agree with that? Well, I think it's going to be a mix, really. Um, I think that the pandemic has encouraged people to shop online. It has moved small brands into e-commerce. So, so, so that's been a huge change. But I still think there's the social aspect of going out shopping, having a cup of coffee with a friend, you know, trying on something. You think it looks wonderful uh, and you try it on and it isn't wonderful. I mean, there, there's, there's that aspect, even with augmented reality and all the other stuff that's supposed to be coming down the line in terms of technology. Technology, I still think there's a physical touch and feel and the social gratification of um, of, of of trying something and feeling transformed. I mean, yeah. you know, it's one thing to look at something online. I bought something online last year um, and it was 
it was what it was, but it was like five times the size it should have been. Do you know? I mean, so there, yeah. you, then you've got to wrap it up and send it back and oh gosh, you know, you can't be yeah. bothered doing all that. So the, it, it's, I think for everyday items, um, online will, will be will be important. But if you really want something special, I still think a special shop, a boot, just something different uh, that offers another experience. I think the big, big retailers having to think about that now, you know, you can't just uh, throw in all the clothes and expect people to come and buy. They've got to get something more from it. And there's nothing more boring, I think, than going into a place and just seeing just this wall of clothes everywhere. I I I, I turn around and go back out. I much prefer something that's it's a little more um, selected and well presented, and that's attractive and that draws me in, you know. And I I'd probably buy there rather than just seeing mounds of stuff, you know. It's it's I think I think we have to consider always the shopper. You have to consider the consumer, and retailers have to be sharp now because things are changing. Yeah. And also the fact that now with COVID, you don't necessarily have, you know, one of the big things that I love about being able to shop in a shop is trying stuff on. Because like that, you know, not, yeah. everything's a different size. Everything looks up. But I suppose, look, you can you can get the look and the feel of it when you're you're in the shop now. Yeah. But so, not being able to try it on is still, um, you know, that's 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 still going to be a challenge for the retailers on the high street that have reopened. So, Absolutely. I know. And it's we started to well, redefine something. what online shopping is. So we, we say, oh, online or offline they're not um they're not completely separate things so most people will browse and do their research online before they shop physically anyway so if you kind of fast forward maybe three to five years and think about what the optimum shopping experience would be so you would you would create your own edit to avoid the sea of clothes feeling um, you you would then go into a store where the edit was pre-selected for you um, with an expert who will never touch your money and um, it, it's all waiting for you in in a fitting room and um, you can try on you know you you literally get scanned on the way out the door you you've, you've selected your expert as much as you've selected your edit because you know that person understands you and speaks your language and then you leave the stuff in store and it's shipped directly to your home you never have to sully yourself by opening your purse or your pocket um, like this is this is where retail is going. It's a combined um, technologically infused experience. So the technology is going to live in the physical more and more. OK, I'm going to just bring in one of the questions that um, it kind of links to sustainability and the online piece that, that came in from the audience. So my little sister had a rapidly growing fashion and sustainability platform housing over 100 European brands. It was at Nova.vee pre-COVID. All of her brands have hugely struggled during the past year to the point where demand has dropped significantly and the website unfortunately has now closed down. Do you think that the, str the struggling is due to major players upping their online um, uh, their marketing and their focus on sustainability or sustainable materials being less available to designers. So do we think... We have been in a global pandemic and, yeah. and it has been a really, really tough time for, um, uh, for fashion brands because fashion was not top of the agenda, you know? So there, there's a little bit of that that we can't ignore. There is also the concern that we're going to eventually live in a world which is populated by maybe top 10 companies who own everything through mergers and acquisitions. And they have the resources to, um, you know, shoulder their way through all the marketplaces, whether it's, you know, fast moving consumer goods or fashion or whatever it is. So I think these are the decisions that we make as conscious consumers to say, well, I am going to go out of my way to support the little guy, the little manufacturer, the little local shop, whatever it is. Um, we it's back to choice again we have the choice to put our money where our mouths are and where our where our values are yeah. yes well yeah. And, and, because have you seen the latest yeah. thing about boohoo investors are now getting very worried about boohoo's practices and boohoo's making like the fortune they made even during pandemic so you know uh it's not always 
the big the big guys can can be taken down if, if they're not following the practices and there's something else i think recently with zara there was some remark made by executive in zara i can't remember now exactly what it was but people are noticing these things i think much more um so boohoo which has been extraordinarily successful throughout the pandemic is now investors are getting worried you know and that sends a signal as well you know you can't have it always and jumping on to, to what Sanyo was saying there, I think the other thing about that we were in a pandemic and especially at the beginning, everybody was worried about finances. Like, like everybody I know was worried about finances. So you were very conscious about where you were spending your money. And while, while uh, towards the end of the pandemic, people are talking about okay, being more conscious and, and supporting small brands and all that, that was at the end of the pandemic. At the beginning, it was every man for himself there was there was a little bit of that mentality at the beginning and i think um when you look at slow fashion when you look at sustainable brands there's a price tag associated with that the products are more expensive and they're more expensive for a reason because of everything that goes into it it's slow fashion things are handmade they're made locally that's more expensive the 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 fabrics are more expensive because they're sourced locally like these aren't made in factories in in china so all of these small things make slow fashion and make these sustainable products a lot more expensive now we are thinking okay well i would rather spend 400 500 euro on that sustainable blazer by that a girl in, for example, I'm wearing Aoife McNamara, and she is a young designer based in Kerry. Her entire ethos of her brand is sustainability. Like, and I mean to, like, she goes out and she cleans her local beach every second morning. Like, it's it, it embodied in her. She only uses local, uh, local brands. She hand makes everything with her and her small team in her studio. They're made to order, but her products are expensive. So you know it's not it wasn't answering that question that was sent in like it, it I, I understand why a lot of these brands didn't succeed or were struggling because at the very beginning of the pandemic we weren't thinking about oh I'm going to invest in a 500 euro blazer because I'm going to help the planet and I'm going to be more sustainable we were thinking right how am I going to pay my mortgage this month and and I think yeah we've come out the other side now fingers crossed and you know it's 15 months down the line so now we're thinking bigger picture and now we're thinking right i'm not going to go on to boohoo and i'm not going to buy you know 50 items for a fiver uh because it's disgusting <laughs> but um it, it's been it's been a learning curve on on so many different levels and i think while uh like Sonia was saying a lot of these brands have suffered i think the ones that that were able to see it through will actually see a rise in in their brands now going forward i that's hope but that's what, yeah. what, where i see it going yeah. Okay, I actually have another question here also on the sustainability kind of front. So, um, hi panel, loving the discussion. On the sustainability, I find it's really difficult to find details on brand websites as to where they source their clothing raw materials. I want to understand if it's sourced in China, Brazil, India, etc., whether there are good pra work practices in place uh, in the factories producing the clothes. Uh, this is a massive concern for me. Um, uh, do, do, do. Will, do you think this is something that brands will be pressurized into doing more in the future and you know more to the certification point do you think something like along those lines could be put in place I don't know who wants to maybe Sonia well, do you want I to think jump Sonia, on that one given I think this, Sonia oh, explains that the, the certification and the regulation at every level is extremely expensive and very torturous and very difficult for small brands so yes it is very very difficult because a lot will say that H&M give you some information about their conscious uh, collection but they don't give you everything so you can't you, there's there's even Stella McCartney, who's at the, in the forefront of sustainable fashion uh, and who's, ethic, who's known for her ethical fashion, even she would admit that it's not always possible to guarantee every single step of the way. So, yes, you're, I mean, I understand your concern and I think a lot of people feel the same concern, but at the moment we still can't, it still can't be, you can't really say anything is fully sustainable. You yeah. can't actually. Yeah, That's I problem. suppose what, what you can do um, in an attempt to answer your question is to ask the question. So really, um, particularly Instagram has become a kind of a customer service tool for brands who authentically engage with their customers. 
So you you have a right to ask a question. You have a right to analyze the answer and see if you're happy with it or not. And it's back to choice. Are you are you happy with the measures that they're taking or are you not? And if you're not, you walk away. And then I think also, you know, it is tricky because the whole fully sustainable fashion market is still very small. And traditionally, it has not been, don't shoot me, Deirdre, it has not been very high design led. It has been led by a sustainable me- message rather than the, the product itself. And I think, you know, just because you are interested in sustainability does not mean that you're willing to look like, you know, you're a sort of an off-duty surfer. Like you, you, you still want beautiful things, right? And that piece of the sustainability fashion market is still very much emerging, you know? But I think it, it, it is about asking the questions and see if you're happy, happy with the answers. And actually touching on that point, there's another question here that's on along the same sort of um, trend. Um, very often my mindset is focused on purchasing high street items of clothing that can be worn a few time and then times and then disposed of. Taking sustainability into account, what would your recommend, recommendations be with regards purchasing more expensive items of clothing that could be reused over, uh, over and over again, yet, uh, yet remain timeless from a fashion perspective? Courtney, do you want to take that one? Yeah, absolutely. I mean... I think we we touched on it earlier that like we can't knock the high street because it is there for a reason and it's affordable and there's a lot of links in the chain just before I get into the actual answer of it, there's a lot of links in the chain of fashion that like you know there's a lot of high-end designers that use the same factories that Primark use but, but it's Primark that are being bashed constantly like we, we don't know that Gucci are using the same factory because these are supply chains so a lot of the time we we aren't we don't have the transparency we don't know what actual factories are being used because that's where that sustainable link is that like you know we don't know if the garment workers are being fairly paid and there's so many different elements to sustainability so I don't think um, don't think that by shopping high end makes you sustainable because it doesn't. And don't think that shopping high street makes you unsustainable because there's so many different ways to be sustainable. You can shop high street, um, buy well, buy like one item from Zara, one great blazer, with the, with the mindset to wear that twice a week, every week for the next five six years. I have jackets blazers from H&M that I've had for nine, 10 years, but uh, that I continuously take out of my wardrobe and rewear. So you can be a level of sustainable shopping the high street. Like you, you, I don't think the consumer should ever bash themselves for shopping high street, because like I said, there's, there's a purpose and it's there for a reason. It's there for that affordability that you can, you know, dress well and, and feel a, a sense of personal style. Not everybody can afford to go and buy that 500 euro blazer. And that's, absolutely fine if you do want to i suppose invest in one or two key pieces that are from sustainable brands or a more sustainable brand i would definitely say it needs to be something that's a staple and um, that you can mix into the rest of your wardrobe something like um Deirdre was mentioning earlier that denim brand native denim they're beautiful dark wash denim gorgeous fit they're ha- they're handmade in Dublin, in a, in, a, in a studio in Dublin. So, you know, if you know that you're a denim wearer and you know that you love to wear denim, instead of buying a pair of denim every year from River Island, from Zara, that ends up getting, you know, washed a few times and then loses its 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 fit, why don't you invest in a great pair of denim from Native? Because like Deirdre had said earlier, they guarantee their quality for five years and they're hoping that you'll wear them for 20 years. So I think that's a good way to, to look at investing in basics. Again, back to the blazer, you could go to the likes of Eva McNamara. She makes amazing suiting. Um, they're just off the top of my head now. Or go for an Irish brand, a piece of a really great piece of knitwear. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's so many options. It really comes down to your personal style and where, where it makes sense for you to invest that, that right. particular piece. And it's like, if you think about like the way we used to buy before, before the likes of Boohoo and ASOS and before Zara blew up as the kind of go-to and on the high street, we always used to buy with the intent to wear. And like, you know, we always had that one great pair of boots that you went to or that amazing pair of shoes that you were, they were your dressy shoes or whatever. And I feel like we're, we're kind of coming back around to that way of thinking as well, whether that's a high street pair or a high end pair, 
it doesn't actually matter. It's about how much you wear that and, and how it lives in your wardrobe. There is one tip that I have for, for investment shopping is that if you ask yourself, so the, the one thing to avoid, avoid if you're hoping to do investment shopping is, is fads and trends um, because they'll die a death. So if you think about the kind of glory days of, of fashion, uh, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, 50s I'm not so into, but maybe you are, uh, the, the best of the 70s, they're, they're kind of the glory days of contemporary fashion. And if you look at the, the garments that you're thinking of buying and ask yourself, would that fit into one of those glory day eras? That means it has repeatability and it's on a, it's on a loop and it'll keep coming back. Whereas if you pick something that, you know, either aiming to be sort of very futuristic or doing its own thing, the chances are that'll, that'll die a death, you know? So if it's grounded in one of fashion's high points, it's likely to, to keep going for you. And that was actually going to be my final question, Sonia. So you might have answered it. I don't know if any of the other ladies want to pop in. I suppose, look, if, if we're going out after this morning, if we're able to sneak out at our lunch hour or shop in our wardrobes or do a bit of shopping online, is there any set rules that you recommend to follow? So so your 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 ideas, your view, Sonia, is something that is going to be timeless, that you're, you, you've seen it before and, and, and it, it's, it's kind of stood the test of time. Courtney, do you have anything to throw in on top of that? My, my rule is that there are no rules or that there should be no rules because I feel like after a year of living in our loungewear and being at home and not being able to socialize, I would like to think that, you know, this little bit of this glimmer of freedom means that people just throw the rule book out the door within reason. I still agree with, with Sonia in that, like when you're investing in pieces, but when you're just dressing for yourself, dress for yourself. Don't be worried about what other people are wearing. Don't be worried about the trends and the fads. Just wear what feels you, what your personal style is. And I think that's when you will become the most stylish and you'll really own, you know, what you're wearing. Brilliant. That's I think great also, advice. And the thing about fashion is it has this great power to transform us to make us feel great. And I think it's, it, yes, fit is very important and color and all the rest of it, but how does it make us feel? And I think the day that you put on that dress that makes you feel 100%, it's always gonna make you feel 100%. The, the day you have that jacket that fits you perfectly, when you put that on and you're ready to face the world, that's the jacket that will make you always ready to face the world. Brilliant. I love it. Well, ladies, thank you so, so much for this morning's discussion. I feel that I've learned loads. I, I definitely have lots of work to do when it comes to, to fashion and, and definitely understanding sustainability so much more. So I really appreciate the three of you taking the time to, to come along and, and talk to us all this morning. I also want to thank um, Astrid and Emer in the background who've done a fantastic job on pulling everything together. So thanks, ladies, for that. And most importantly, I want to thank um, all our guests for dialing in and taking time out of your busy day to um, join us this morning. I'm really hopeful that soon we will be able to get to back to meet um, in person again um, and get to see everyone and, and, and say hello. Um, and um, as I mentioned at the start, the, this morning's event was recorded, so um, we will be able to circulate that over the next few, few days. And uh, look, ladies, I hope you all have a fabulous day and get out there and enjoy the sunshine. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.